Now, um, if you, how many of you were at last night's talk? Oh, very well attended. Um, so, um, a little bit of personal um, biography was given about me uh, at the time, and that was that my background is in physics and math. Um, I started out uh, wanting to get a PhD in uh, physics, but didn't have really the experimental skills, so I went on uh, in math. The problem was, kind of uh, both providential and problematic, is my father died my senior year in uh, college, and he had taught medieval philosophy. So I got all his books, and while I was studying uh, math, I was mostly reading philosophy, and as often happens, when you're not doing, I mean, I did the work, but I wasn't concentrating on the math. And for something like advanced math in graduate school, you really have to concentrate on that. That has to be what you're thinking about. So um, I left with a, what they called a terminal master's, which was a very polite way of saying that I wasn't doing well enough to go on. And that's okay, you know, um, because life takes its uh, turns. And I worked as an engineer in Boston for a while, but I found myself, um, doing the same thing as I worked as an engineer. Um, I, it was on the first PCs, the operating system was on one floppy disk, the program was on another floppy disk, and the floppy disk was like about that, right? Um, and the tests I would run on these screens um, would take about an hour and 15 minutes to run the calculation, so I'd take a measurement and then set it going. So I'm sitting there, I've got time, so I would just sit there and I would read philosophy. So I eventually decided, you know what, I think I should just do philosophy. Maybe I won't get a job in philosophy, but I love doing this. If I don't get a job in philosophy, I could always come back and do the engineering. So uh, that's what I did, and I came here, and I studied medieval philosophy mostly. But I always retain a kind of interest in science and what science tells us about the world. And in some ways, that goes back to my uh, life in college. Not just college, high school as well, but mostly in college. And that's because I was blessed with teachers of a certain sort. And I really want to underline this, right, uh, because you are all teachers. The sorts of teachers who communicate a kind of wonder about the world and the way in which scientific understanding um, enriches that wonder. One of the things I recall was that in studying physics, it wasn't like um, the answer, or sorry, it wasn't like I stopped having questions. What happened was the questions got deeper, right? And I think that's actually a sign of good teaching in almost anything. That is, it increases the wonder of students to wonder about the subject matter. And that could be history, that could be theology, that could be art, it could be, you know, accounting that um, when the initial questions of the student are answered, it just raises more questions for them and more sophisticated questions. The questions you're asking in a quantum uh, mechanics course in college are way beyond the questions about vector addition that you're asking in the first couple weeks of general physics as a freshman, right? You couldn't ask those questions in quantum mechanics except for general physics, but boy, it's different. Right? And it's fascinating and it's wonderful. And so um, right now I actually do want to thank the teachers I had be precisely because of that. One in particular was this guy Jim Lang. He was um, the main physics teacher at my small college. And he was a very good friend of my father who taught medieval philosophy. And uh, my father said, and they were kind of social you know, friends in the sense of they went to the same faculty parties. And, he, and my father used to say about Dr. Lang, he said, you know, he's the funniest, the funniest man in the room at a dinner party because he makes physics funny, right? People, people think they can't talk to this guy. And he just takes ordinary things and makes them by talking about how they work in terms of the physics of them. He just is able to get you not just to wonder about it, but to actually laugh about it. And forgive me for the earthiness of this, he said, I, he said, I remember one night in 1964 at, a, at the dean's dinner party, and there's Jim, and he's actually <coughs> explaining the physics of the toilet, right? And, he's, and my dad said, of course, you should never talk about the toilet over dinner, but Jim had us laughing in the aisles, right? Because of the wonder of something as ordinary as that. How does that work, right? Um, not just the wonder of um, creation, but just the wonder of the ordinary and so on. 
The other story about the two of them before getting it more into the guts of this that I'd like to get into is my father worked on, um, as I say, medieval philosophy. And um, this goes actually back into the ancients, but in the ancient world, uh, let's see, whoa, I didn't realize I had animated this. Oh, <laughs> um, in the ancient world, of course, you had from Pythagoras uh, the sense that there's a kind of harmony in the world. And that um, for Pythagoras, everything was number, right? Everything was a kind of relationship of numbers. And that was reality. And one of the things that came out of that was this thing called the music of the spheres. That when we study astronomy, what we see is an extraordinary harmony of the movements of planets and stars. And that that was akin to music. It's just that we weren't attuned with our physical ears to hear it because it's not really a physical music. It's an intellectual music. And this becomes a major metaphor. Um, well, for them, it wasn't so much a metaphor. For us, it's a kind of metaphor. But for them, it was sort of the heart of reality was the so-called music of the spheres. And this works its way through Boethius. This works its way through the Middle uh, Ages. Um, it's actually even in someone like Kepler. Right? So Kepler was very interested in the idea of the music of the spheres and working out these harmonies. That's why we get Kepler's laws, the way the harmonies work. And he took that very seriously. So uh, my father told me that one day he had been lecturing on the music of the spheres as a kind of image in medieval philosophy. And he was just going on very poetically. It's in Dante as well going on very poetically about what this meant and thinking about God and the universe and so on. God's the musician, in other words, for the medieval uh, philosopher and theologian. So he was just full of himself. The adrenaline was just uh, bursting as he left class and he's walking down the street and there he sees Dr. Lang. <coughs> and he says to Dr. Lang, his name was Jim, he said, Jim, Jim. And Dr. Lang was like, what's wrong, Bill? What's wrong? Because he was just you know, so excited. He said, Jim. Can you hear the music of the spheres? And Dr. Lang in this just deadpan way said, oh God, Bill, I can't turn the damn stuff off. <laughs> and that's what I mean about the sense of wonder and the sense of awe. Um, uh, Socrates says that philosophy begins in wonder, right? And it doesn't end, it should deepen. And what I want to come, or what I want to come through in this presentation to you is that the appropriate attitude of uh, a Christian towards, uh, or just any Jew, uh, uh, religious believer, say Judaism as well as Islam, the, practic the practical result of this should be that the believer in God, believing that God has created the universe, should think of the universe as in many ways a communication from God. And if that's the case, we should love the study of the universe. It shouldn't simply be a matter of, well, you've got to get this kind of education in order to do such and such. It becomes a way of loving God. And if I were to go back, right, the, um, I can't go back. Oh, well. But the Hopkins quote there, right? You see in that a deep, it's poetry, and Hopkins was not a scientist, but you see a deep love of God as as not a nature worship, but as a nature as a communication from God, the creator. So um, that's what I want to focus on, um, in, at least today. Tomorrow, uh, what I'll try to do is talk a little bit more about a sort of robust understanding <coughs> of causality and the way in which to understand the causality of natural things in relationship to the causality of God. Because I think quite often, what uh, we see in the so-called conflict between uh, faith and reason or religion and science is a failure to think deeply about what it is to be a natural cause versus what it is to be a creative cause, right? But so for today, it's just working through um, what science does, what um, faith does, how they should be thought of kind of uh, epistemologically. So broadly, um, this point about epistemology, in philosophy, and I don't know how much philosophy background many of you have, but epistemology in philosophy is thought to be the study of knowledge. Okay? So we have the two Greek words episteme and logos. Of course, logos is the word that John chose for the beginning of the Gospel of John that I quoted last night. In the beginning was the word. 
In English, that's kind of flat. In the beginning was the word. In Latin, the word in the Vulgate, it was um, uh, verbum. And that's why in English we get word. In the beginning was the word, because word is a very good translation of verbum. Um, but the word is Greek, logos. And logos is this extraordinarily rich term in Greek. It can mean word, statement, and so on. But the deeper meaning of it tends to be intelligibility, rationality, reason, account, explanation. It's just a very deep and rich term. So epistemology, logos, logi, um, what? Well, epistemology then, ep episteme means knowledge. So epistemology, typical philosophy etymology, etymology, um, all these lo biology, all these lo logi words, right? Anthropology. Um, well, so the account of knowledge, the intelligibility of knowledge, what is knowledge? And so when we think about faith and when we think about science, everyone will typically grant that science is a kind of knowledge, right? The Latin for science was scientia, and that very straightforwardly meant science. Last night we talked about wisdom. Wisdom being something more than merely knowledge. Wisdom was a kind of knowledge that allows you to put order into your own life and the life of the world around you. So it's both descriptive knowledge and normative in the sense of this is the way you should live in the world that you now understand. So that's the notion of wisdom. But knowledge is more simply the kind of, well, what is this? Right? How does it work? Right? How does it relate to other things without necessarily talking about the normative? Well, immediately you can start to see um, in, against the background of a certain way of thinking about the relationship of faith and um, uh, reason, reason being represented primarily by science, a possibility for a difficulty, which I do think quite often animates our culture, and that is, well, look, if science is knowledge, it should also count as wisdom, right? Because on the other hand, it seems as though faith, the way the thing gets set up, religious faith, isn't knowledge. And so religious faith can't be wisdom if it's not knowledge. Maybe it's feeling. Maybe it's inner meaning. Maybe it's finding a purpose in life that isn't necessarily a kind of normative purpose, a purpose that binds you as opposed to, as Nietzsche would put it, you create for yourself. Okay. So if faith isn't knowledge, it can't be wisdom. So what, might else, what else might be wisdom? Well, you can just go to a college or a university and you'll see a whole bunch of different claims for wisdom on the basis of disciplines of knowledge. The historians will claim we're wisdom, right? Because we tell you how things came to be in our lives culturally, and we tell you about the contingency of things, and everything is fleeting in a way, right? Um, some would say there are historical causes, others would say no, there are no historical causes. So by giving you an account of the history of your culture, for instance, or the history of the world, or the history of your state. We're giving you the wisdom you need to live your life. You're an American, so live the life of an American. You're a European, so live the life of a European. That's just where you are, that's what formed you. You're um, uh, an African, so live the life of an African. An Asian, live the life of an Asian. You can't help yourself, you've been formed that way. right? So history could make a claim to wisdom. Physics can make a claim to wisdom. What is everything? Right? Very famous uh, physicist, Arthur Eddington. This podium, actually he, was, he had a desk, but he was giving a lecture. Let's say this is a desk, and he sits on the desk. Sorry. This desk is mostly empty space. That's reality. And if you're going to live your life according to reality, you need to understand there aren't substances, there aren't dogs, there's mostly empty space. There aren't cats, there's mostly empty space. There aren't human beings, there's mostly empty space. That's what you are. Come to understand that, have that knowledge, and live your life accordingly. And you're like, 
How the hell am I supposed to live my life accordingly is mostly empty space. <laughs> It's a big stretch there, right? I, I want to know more, right? So maybe I'll be a biologist and say, well, I understand what you physicist, uh, physicists are saying, but um, really I'm, a, I'm an animal, right? And I've got urges and desires and needs and want to um, survive and promote the survival of the species. So the biologist will make a claim to wisdom. This is something that John Henry Newman focused upon, the, um, the cardinal and now saint, John Henry Cardinal Newman, um, focused upon um, in the second half of his idea of a university, and that is all the diverse claims to wisdom based upon all the diverse claims about knowledge and a kind of competition to say, well, we're the real knowledge, right? Now, the temptation then might be to say, well, as a person of faith, what I need to do is exclude those claims to knowledge. And what would be the way to exclude those claims to knowledge? Or sorry, those claims to wisdom. Because after all, revelation gives me wisdom. There's the book of wisdom, for God's sakes. right? Um, and there's Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ tells me how to live. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Okay? So let's push the sciences away. Let's fear them. Because as claims to knowledge they also make a further claim to wisdom. And what I would like to suggest to you is the claim to knowledge is legitimate. The claim to wisdom is questionable. As a philosopher, I'm not just going to reject it, right? You have to examine claims, but um, it's questionable. And partially that's because as epistemic disciplines, what do sciences do? Well, they limit their perspective. Right? They take a reality and say, consider this reality this way. And that means you're bracketing all sorts of aspects of the reality of the thing you're studying. So example from all the way back, 18 years old, I'm in Dr. Lang's general physics class. He goes up to the board. So Arthur Eddington said, you are mostly empty space. Why are you mostly empty space? Well, because you're made up of molecules. And molecules are made up of atoms. And between the atoms in a molecule is mostly empty space. Now let's look at the atoms. Well, you look at the atoms, you've got neutrons, protons, and electrons. Now, the neutron is a nice big ball, right? Or sorry, the nucleus is, of protons and uh, um, neutrons. And they're kind of tightly packed, but between the nucleus and the first electron, that's mostly empty space. And he, you get the analogy of if the nucleus is the sun, the first electron is basically a basketball on Earth. Okay. Well, there's mostly empty space. Well, what happens when you put a whole lot of mostly empty space together? Empty space plus empty space equals empty space. Let's add some more mostly empty space. Well, you still get more. <laughs> you get some more mostly empty space. Well, Dr. Lang didn't start with that. What he started with is he said, you are a point mass. Really? <laughs> I'm writing that down. Point mass is writing this down. Right? Yes, you are a point mass. And the first three weeks, we learned about vector addition. And what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the velocity and the position of that point mass that you are. And we're going to talk about forces that act upon that point mass. So I was like, okay, I'll go with it. I had faith in my teacher. So we do our vector addition on forces. We learn certain basic principles, conservation of momentum, okay. velocity, position. We're getting a little bit of calculus. And we're doing all the equations of mass, or sorry, the equations of motion on me, the point mass, or my fellow student, the other point mass, right? Um, we learn, ooh, there's a little gravitational attraction here. Maybe we could go out on Friday night, we point masses, <laughs> right? So you do all this for three weeks, and then Dr. Lane comes in and he says, okay, you're not really a point mass. You're an extended mass. Now, remember everything I taught you about point masses, but as an extended mass, you have a center of gravity, or a center of mass, I should say. But, you're, but you are extended. 
Why is that important? Because if those forces are going to act on the extension, they're not necessarily going to act right at the um, center of mass. And that means that this extended mass might actually start to spin. Uh-oh. So that the force acts in such a way that it spins, but doesn't necessarily move in the way in which, which it would if it acted at the point mass. Oh, uh, no. So let me tell you about moment of inertia. Now let me introduce principle of conservation of angular momentum. And frankly, if there was a point in my physics education where I thought God existed, that is an argument for the existence of God. I mean, of course, I thought God exists, but it's an argument for God's existence. It was, it was, what? The conservation of angular momentum. I was like, everything else before that, it was like, well, that makes sense. And then that, I was like, what the hell? <laughs> the ice skater, as you all know, when she draws her hands in, she speeds up. Why? In the spinning. Because you're changing the moment of inertia, but because of the conservation of angular momentum, the angular speed has to increase. Oh! And then even weirder is it increases according to that thing called the right-hand rule. Right? So in the direction of your right hand, you put it there, and oh, so the... Oh, so I ride my bike. Why don't I fall off? I fall off if I'm not riding it. I'm just sitting on it. It's really hard to balance. Faster I ride, it's less I have to balance because I can't fall off the bike because the wheels are spinning this way. So the, uh, mo the vector of angular momentum is orthogonal according to the right-hand rule. Why is it the right-hand rule? Well, it just kind of works for, to use the right hand as representing it. And my God exists, right? <laughs> Another three or four weeks, and it's like, well, now we got to start talking about frictional forces, which are non-conserving. Now we got to get into equations that have complicated non-conservation principles in them. And you're like, oh, my God. But what's happening here is we start with an idealization that says, of a very complicated reality, if we're going to understand it, we make these idealizations. And then we try to add back. We try to get back to something. Well, the fact that we get back to a kind of complicated something in physics doesn't mean we get back to the complicated reality of the thing itself. Because the physicist never gets from your point mass to you're a living animal that reproduces. That's why you need biology. Biology adds back in. So we do these idealizations to get at the reality because the reality gets easier for us by the idealization. The whole complicated thing is very difficult for us. Maybe God understands it. But we need the idealizations to do this. Okay. The problem with that is something that Lewis Carroll said. Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty took a great fall. And all the king's horses and all the king's men could not put Humpty Dumpty back together again. You might call this the problem of analysis. What are you doing? when you say point mass, or extended mass, or frictional forces on an extended mass. Well, what you're doing is you're cracking the egg. The problem with cracking the egg is you could glue it back together. This is the problem of synthesis. Is you've got all these things, and it's difficult to know how to put them to get the egg back. Right? Another example I like to use that kind of grosses out my students what do you, what's the, well, maybe not the first thing, because I hated biology, so I don't remember much of it. Um, tried to forget, creative forgetfulness, as Nietzsche would call it. Otherwise, I'd be held back in my success. Um, at least, what's one of, the, one of the first things you do in, to study biology? The study of life, what do you do? You kill the cat. You start studying biology by studying dead things. Things that were alive. Well, maybe you didn't kill it, but somebody killed it, or something killed it. And so you say, well, we need to study the structures of its body. The problem is you're studying the structures of a body in order to understand a living body that moves according to the structure of dead bodies that don't move. Well, that's useful. But you're going to have to do more to understand the living movement rather than just the remains of the thing that was alive and moved. That's not going to give you life. So 
Um, the, that's a first point about the epistemology of science. We engage in idealizations. We put them into formulas, mathematical formulas typically, because we're really good at math. Right? Um, but what does the math represent? If you do engineering, electrical engineering, anybody study electrical engineering in here? You're going to get those, what's that? Long time. Yeah. <laughs> I've forgotten more physics than I care to remember, and I suspect you might say the thing, same thing about electrical engineering. You get these functions with the weird um, x, e to the i x, right? Plus another one that's basically um, x or y, e to the, uh, sorry, e to the i x and then plus e to the minus i x. Well, one of those is the imaginary side. The imaginary side, well, why? Because it's got an imaginary number. An imaginary number, well, what is that? Square root of minus one. Now, those equations, when you put those in there, are really easy to solve. You can do electrical engineering without that e to the minus ix. It's really hard. So you put that in there, and it's like, Phew. well, what the hell does that represent? It doesn't need to represent anything. It just makes the math easy, and you can solve the problem. So sometimes the idealizations, also you might say, <coughs> I, I, I'm wary to say this, but it's almost like they misrepresent the reality precisely to get the solution. If you know your history of astronomy, Ptolemaic astronomy with the epicycles was actually pretty good at telling you where the planet was going to be. Copernicus comes in and he puts the sun at the center of the orbits. That seems more realistic because what the hell are these epicycles? Are we supposed to think there are wires up there that the thing is moving on? You know, so the epicycle's going around on the major orbit, but the epicycle itself is rotating on a point that's going around on the major orbit, and it gets you the planet going backwards sometimes. That worked really well to tell you where the planet was going to be, but the objection to it is, well, is it real? How could that possibly be real? What would be required for it to be real? It can't be real. Copernicus put the sun in the center. And then you just have regular orbits. The problem with that was he couldn't tell you where the planets were going to be. Ptolemy was better. So you have a predictive theory that's judged to be good on the basis of its prediction, but judged to be bad on the basis of its reality. But if you want to know where that planet's going to be, use Ptolemy at that point. But this seems more real, but it's not as good at observation. So what does Copernicus do? He adds in some epicycles. He says, well, with some epicycles, I can make it as good as, in fact, better than Ptolemy. Yeah, but that's the objection to Ptolemy. Yes, but if you want prediction, you might introduce a little idealization that's a, kind of not real, but makes the math easier. And then, of course, along comes um, uh, Tycho Brahe and Kepler, and what do they do? Well, Kepler particularly. Oh, Copernicus's problem was that he had the sun at the center of a circular orbit. It's actually at one of the foci of an ellipse. You do that, you don't need any of those epicycles. You still don't have an explanation, though, because why would the thing be moving in an ellipse? You've got a relationship mathematically expressed in Kepler's laws, but what don't you have? Force of gravity. You need Newton for that. So what are you getting there? You're getting a kind of idealizations that start out as good for t saying this is the way things are going to look, but you're not getting explanations until finally you get this force of gravity. And then along comes Einstein. And Einstein's like, well, <laughs> maybe there's no force of gravity. There's just curved space-time. And the planets are just kind of rolling around like balls on one of those things in the mall that you put the penny in and it just swirls around. Maybe that's it. There's just this curved space-time. There's no forces. And what is reality? Mostly empty space. So you've gone from the mostly empty space of uh, molecules and atoms and so on in the representation of atomic physics to mostly empty space in the representation of general relativity. Okay, all very good, all very wonderful, 
um, mostly true. I know I'll say something about why I say mostly there. But nonetheless, idealization, where the reality of the things that confront us is lost. Well, lost for a purpose, but how do you get it back? That's why you need more. You need other sciences. And perhaps you need social sciences if you want to talk about human life. And maybe you need another science if you want to talk about human destiny. Okay? And that might be what brings wisdom. Something that takes it all and puts it together and helps you to live according to the understanding of reality. Nonetheless, all of these things communicate something about God, according to Hopkins. So typically, the problem of faith and reason, as I say, interrupt if you want to, because otherwise I'm just going to keep going. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Which is wisdom. Well, that would go back to um, the, the richer sense of um, logos in the Greek, right? Was it feminine or masculine? Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and, and Sophia then takes you back to, a certain, to the book of wisdom, right, in the Old Testament. So you see a kind of continuity, right, and so on. So yeah. Um, uh, but that's an example, right, where because of the problem of translation now with regard to scripture, What's well, a very rich word in the Greek in which John wrote it becomes a kind of very flat word in English. In the beginning was the word, you know, like what, a verb or a, a noun or a, you know, um, I don't know, a conjunction, a, a word. Just word sounds very flat, okay? Understanding, intelligibility, wisdom, these are very rich words um, that express more than that take a lot of describing, right? Word doesn't take a lot of describing, right? Word functions linguistically to communicate meaning in a language. Oh, let's move on. Logos, oh, what's an explanation? What is intelligibility? Whose intelligibility? Certainly not mine if it was before the beginning of Genesis. So yes, it's, it's, it's much more complicated, much richer. But there's a way in which if you look at, so it's um, this is partially what I love about people engaging is I can get off my damn outline because I'm always worried that the outline's not very good. Um, but um, so what Hopkins says there and the idea of studying science, there's a way in which you can conceive of studying science as a Christian as following through on the gospel of John. Because he doesn't just say, in the beginning was the Logos, and the Logos saved us. He says, through him all things were made. Nothing was made without him. That is, nothing was made without the intelligibility of God, who makes all things intelligible. So when you grasp intelligibility in the study of the world, whether it's history, chemistry, sociology, even for God's sakes, accounting. I hate accountants. Because they can tell me what I can't spend. But, you're, what's that? <laughs> well, I hate you. Um, I'm sure your mother loves you. Um, be kind to your web footed friends because they may be somebody's mother. Um, sorry. That's the first time that's ever happened to me. And the last. Um, but that, that the study of the universe in all these different modes is a way of fulfilling your destiny as to in knowing God. It's not the only way to know God. And we'll see that Thomas Aquinas suggests a reason for other ways of knowing God. But somebody over here had their hand. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Sure. Um, he talks about sacramentality and how, like, sacraments are the specific times in which we experience God's grace, uh, but God's grace is around us everywhere and at all times. And yeah. So we need to become, like, sacramental beholders and see the sacrament and the sacred in all things. Kind of like the Jesuit model, like, finding God in all things. Yeah. And so the specific concept. Hopkins, was, by the way, was a Jesuit. So the Jesuits aren't entirely bad. 
Um, no, that's, um, that's in a sense what um, I'm getting at is, and, and this will be our distinction in theology between a sacrament and a sacramental, right? Something that isn't strictly a sacrament, but nonetheless does still communicate something that, that's a sign of something. And if you want, um, I'm, I imagine that Father Terry Ehrman is going to go to town on this um, in his uh, talks. Um, he'll have you singing to trees before, you're, before <laughs> it's all over. I talk to the trees, but they don't listen to me. Um, yes, um, I'll have uh, that drink later. Um, but uh, yeah, so, so that's, uh, I think that's the basis of this, right, is the beginning of the Gospel of John. But not just the beginning of the Gospel of John, Genesis, and we'll talk about that. Um, because that takes us back to Genesis. Right now, I want to draw um, a distinction, philosophers like to do this, uh, driven by a way in which even Catholic institutions, certainly broadly Christian institutions, talk about faith and reason. And that is, they talk about faith and reason. Right? So you have a conjunction, faith and reason. And what um, you'll see, even at this beautiful, wonderful place, and now I'm criticizing my dear mother, my alma mater, even at the University of Notre Dame and probably any Catholic college, even your high schools, if you have high, uh, mission statements, um, they'll talk about faith and reason. This is a place where faith and reason can coexist. And that's a response, right? That's a kind of defensive response about Catholic education or Christian education. What's it a response to? It's a response to um, the thought that uh, what we have out in the world is an understanding of faith versus reason. They're in conflict. And so the thought is that in the Catholic institution, in the Catholic worldview, and some Christian worldviews, it's not faith versus reason, it's faith and reason. But what does that do? It continues to perpetuate the idea that these are distinct things. Right? Distinct cultural phenomena, say. Right? So reason, what's that represented by? Well, ideally, physics. And if you couldn't quite hack the physics, you do chemistry. Sorry, I'm a physics major, so that was, the, that was our sense, right? Um, and if you couldn't do the chemistry, you did the biology. If you couldn't do the biology, you did the psychology. <laughs> yes. Is there a physics major who can help me out here? Um, but um, so the thought is, what I want to suggest to you, and this is something you get out of, say, St. Augustine um, and St. Thomas, is that actually it's not faith and reason. Right? It's faith-informed reason and reason-informed faith. There's a kind of dynamic life between these things. Okay? So the example I gave you last night, right? and I'd love to do this in classes, how many of you know who your father is? And some people won't know who their father is, right? But how many of you know who your father is? How many of you have taken a DNA test? So a few people have taken a DNA test, okay? Those of you who haven't taken a DNA test, do you think you don't know who your father is because you haven't taken a DNA test? No. <laughs> What's that? Well, now, that now that you mention it, yeah. <laughs> But this is the thing, is that within, within five minutes of, an, of the very first day of uh, class in philosophy, and I don't like doing this, but it's to teach a lesson to the students, close the door, within five minutes I can have them denying that they know who their fathers are. <laughs> and I tell them not to meet me at graduation because they're going to introduce me to their father. And I'm going to say, do you remember that day, first day of class, when you denied that you know who your father is? <laughs> Who's this guy? And your parents are going to be like, $60,000 a year for that? Right? No, it's knowledge. Right? It is knowledge. You know who your parents are. You know who your father is because you know who your mother is. Your father knows he's your father because of his faith in your mother. Not even he has the knowledge that your mother has. Your mother, your mother has a unique knowledge. She communicates that knowledge to you and to your father because you have a relationship of trust to her. That's called faith. That faith in your mother enables your knowledge. 
It's not faith and reason. It's reason enabled by faith. So faith enables reason. Similarly, reason deepens faith. Because now you can seek to understand your father better. You can even seek to understand your mother better. Right? And your brothers and sisters. You can live a better life by learning things from others. You go into that physics class. You trust that teacher. That teacher brings you to a point where you're doing frickin' quantum mechanics. And you're seeing the world in a really interesting way. First day of general physics, that was when you started to move to the understanding of quantum mechanics. Because Dr. Lang came in and called you a point mass. Okay, so um, in all of these things, we are not, in fact, beings capable of achieving knowledge. Forget about wisdom, knowledge simply by ourselves. Mathematics even. You have to actually trust the teacher. And then you learn mathematics and you get to a point where you basically are asked to leave, but not till graduate school. So um, not faith versus reason and frankly not faith and reason. Because again, notice the way that by putting it that way, you have reason and then you have faith and, and we say, oh, that's wonderful, that's good, you should have faith, it's really meaningful, but of course it's not part of reason. Perhaps it's irrational, as the faith versus reason people would say, if they're on the reason side, faith is irrational. Or, as we put it in our mission statements, faith is maybe not irrational, but it's non-rational. Right? But it's a good thing to have. It's not a way of seeing the world and seeing your relationship to God. Because after all, what, if it's non-rational, what claim can you make that's rational about God? Okay, so... Um, I am just facilitating the question oh, okay. and answer sessions now. Yeah, good. So, um, a particular example of this, which many Christians sort of um, thought was great, was when Stephen Jay Gould enunciated what he called NOMA, non-overlapping magisteria. Science is about facts and theories. Faith is about meaning and value and maybe ethics. Except, of course, the ethics is going to have to be non-rational since it's not part of reason, which is expressed in science. I think Gould would acknowledge that there are modes of reason that aren't just scientific modes, but that's one way in which you might take that. And what I want to say is what you get in someone like Aquinas, um, who formulates something like this in the first question of the Summa, is a sense of, and he gets this from Augustine, um, faith-informed reason. In terms of revelation, there is overlap. After all, if you take the Noma view, right, you're going to end up spiritualizing uh, various features of revelation. And in particular, it does look like, and of course Dawkins actually wrote a piece responding to um, Gould on this, basically saying, yeah, that's ridiculous. Religious people, especially Christians and Jews, are making claims about the world all the time. And facts, making claims, factual claims about the world. For instance, Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. I love C.S. Lewis's response to the spiritualizing of that. C.S. Lewis says, well, the way in which people want to talk about that now so that they don't get contradicted by a scientist is that, well, it's a kind of spiritual meaning. Right? There's a passage in Evelyn Waugh's Bride's Head Revisited about spiritual rain. So he's this guy's taking instruction and in being a Catholic from a priest, and the priest says, what's the pa doctrine of papal infallibility? And this guy Rex Matram says, well, everything the, Roman, or everything the Pope says is true. And the priest says to him, what if he says it's going to rain tomorrow? And Rex says, um... I suppose that's true. And the priest says, but what if it doesn't rain tomorrow? And Rex is like, oh, I see, Father, yeah, yeah. <sighs> he's trying to think it through. He's kind of dull. He's trying to marry a um, Julia Marchmain, but he's just this kind of dull uh, politician. And um, 
he thinks for a minute, and then he says, I've got it, Father. I understand. I see what you're getting at. What the Pope meant was that it would rain spiritually. Only we're too blinded by original sin to see it. So spiritualizing um, revelation. This is something Augustine was concerned with in Gnosticism. Taking revelation and saying it doesn't make any sense against the background of what we definitely know about the world. That, remember, that's one of his principles of scriptural interpretation. So spiritualize everything. So spiritualize the virgin birth. Right? It's not making a claim about the biology. It's not making a claim about Mary's relationship to Joseph. These are facts in the world. It's making some sort of spiritual thing. And the great thing about spiritual interpretation of scripture is you can say anything. Right? And Lewis comes back and he says, well, I am just sorry about this one because it's, you can tell me all you want about um, sperm and egg. Right? And you can tell me all you want about biology. But I'm going to tell you this. First century Jews knew that you only get children from sex. So it's not like they didn't know what they were claiming when they insisted on that. Right? So you'd have to attribute an extraordinary ignorance of where babies come from beyond just they don't know that they come from sperm and egg. They also didn't know that they came from sex. Right? Resurrection of Christ. If Christ has not risen, we are of all men most foolish. Paul seems to be going right at the idea of spiritualizing that and saying, nope, we have no hope unless Christ has really risen from the dead. But that can't happen. People don't rise from the dead. So um, Dawkins is right. Christians, Jews, they make claims about the world, factual claims. And so should we just abandon Christianity, as Dawkins would say, for its irrationality? Because faith is one thing, reason is another, and they're in conflict. Gould, well, they're not, a, the faith is one thing, reason is another. He agrees with Dawkins, reason as represented by science. But they're not in conflict because they talk about two completely different things. One about facts, one about meaning and value. Values. What are your values? Okay, and so on. So, um, that's one way to see it. What Aquinas is going to say is, he's going to actually say, now, the way he talks about philosophy, I mentioned that philosophy can be understood as the search for wisdom. That's a very broad notion of it, one that he accepts, and the early church was engaged in thinking about when it confronted uh, Greek philosophy, the search for wisdom. There's a more narrow sense of philosophy, a more technical sense, and that is, in Aquinas, those disciplines that attempt to help you understand the world without the assistance of revelation. Okay? So that those disciplines where you don't employ what you know through revelation in order to um, solve the difficulties you're trying to understand. And in his time, philosophy in that sense would have been everything we now call a natural science. It would have been included biology, it would have included um, uh, uh, physics, math, in the states in which they existed at the time, which was not very developed. Nonetheless, it was this kind of broad integrative understanding and in this technical sense that doesn't rely upon faith in God revealing something. And the interesting question he raises is, is it necessary for there to be a discipline in addition to the philosophical disciplines? Now, as a philosopher, I step back and I say, okay, you can immediately answer that, or you can step back and say, what does the posing of the question tell you? What's presupposed in the posing of the question? What's presupposed in the posing of the question by Aquinas is these philosophical disciplines, including what we would now call physics, chemistry, biology, sociology, psychology, even accounting, um, these philosophical disciplines they actually do succeed. Because he's asking, do we need anything more? He's not asking, what do they do? Do they do anything? He's saying, look at this. These are marvelous. They actually do tell us a lot about the world. So why should we need anything more? What would the more be? Well, for him, the more is revelation. He calls it sacra doctrina. 
revelation and systematic reflection upon revelation. So he says, do we need something more than those, presupposing that those actually do in fact work and they in fact tell you about the world in the ways in which they try to tell you? And his answer to that is to say, yes, we do. We do need something more. He says, they do succeed, but what we need is something to tell us about God and the relationship of all of this to God. He then grants something. He says, these philosophical disciplines, now you've got to be careful, right? He'd be thinking more in terms of metaphysics. Um, but these philosophical disciplines do tell us something about God. Okay? But he says, it takes an awful long time for them to talk about God. And human beings are such that they don't have a lot of time to spend the amount of time they need to to talk about God on the basis of these philosophical disciplines. And it's really hard. It's not easy to talk about God unless you anthropomorphize. Jesus Christ is human, yes, but God, God, I mean, if God is responsible for the existence of everything, he's no human. He's not like me until he becomes incarnate in Jesus Christ. So we need to know about God. Why do we need to know about God? Because we are created for union with God. But we're created for a particular form of union with God, which in involves knowing and loving God and pursuing God as a lover pursues. It's love, so it's not God just stamps us as united with God. God wants us to love him. To love him, we need to, because we're human beings, we need to do that intelligently and rationally. With passion, but nonetheless informed by reason. To achieve your end, you need to know the end and how to get to the end. And that's what Thomas thinks sacred revelation pr provides. That's why it's necessary. It doesn't make up for or substitute for the philosophical disciplines. They are about something else. But they do enrich your understanding of revelation. Revelation doesn't substitute for physics. But physics can, in fact, enrich your understanding of what has been revealed. So the philosophical disciplines become aids to the understanding. But what's the presupposition of now the answer? Sacred revelation communicates understanding. It's not something other than reason. It's reasoning about God and our relationship to God. But of course, we're in the world, which means there's facts about us that need to be communicated in Revelation. Yes, you had a question or a comment? And when you're talking about Revelation, you're talking about natural Hang on one second, one second. Let's uh -huh. The online people need to be able to hear. When you're referring to revelation, you're talking about natural revelation, written revelation, just I'm, revelation uh, in <laughs> this general. Is sound, I, uh, I, uh, I almost said something utterly redundant, but why not say it? I'm talking about revealed revelation. Um, so, All we can know and, yeah. and find out and so, so learn if about you got, if, And for whatever reason, I couldn't go back to Gerard Manley Hopkins, or did I? Yeah, right? So you can think of this as a kind of revelation, and that might be called natural revelation. What you don't want to do is become um, a nature worshiper. This is a picture of Mount Hood out in um, Oregon, and I used to live out there, and I would have to drive home. I taught at the University of Portland, and the last 10 miles of my drive were along the highway on the northern side of the Willamette River, and so for 10 miles I would stare at Mount Hood the entire way. And I almost wrote an essay, and anybody from Oregon listening, I'm sorry, but um, <laughs> I gotta be careful. But I almost wrote an essay, um, why is the Northwest so godless? Because it is, I mean, just statistically, right? I mean, there are like 10% are, um, are Christians and everybody else is sort of like godless. Well, they're not really godless. What they typically are is nature worshipers. And my answer to that question was going to be because it's so easy to worship nature, right? <laughs> and so you don't want that to become an excuse for worshiping nature. What you're doing is you're seeing that 
um, in relationship to the being that um, created it. Let me just put a quote up from St. Augustine, if I could get it. So what you're talking about is you need to make a distinction between creation and the creator. Yes. Yeah. Um, see if we have it. Yes. Um, this is St. Augustine in Sermon 242.2. Question the beauty of the earth, question the beauty of the sea, question the beauty of the air, distending and diffusing itself, question the beauty of the sky. So you think these are the scientists. Right? Question the beauty of the earth, question the beauty of the sea, question the beauty of the air, distending and diffusing itself, question the beauty of the sky, question all these realities. All respond, see, we are beautiful. Their beauty is a profession. These beauties are subject to change. Who made them if not the beautiful one who is not subject to change? Again, that's what Hopkins is capturing. It's the study of reality around you, which you might call natural knowledge, as opposed to revealed knowledge, because I don't want to say revelation and knowledge. I'm talking about knowledge that is not revealed by God and knowledge that is revealed by God. The study of knowledge, or the knowledge that is not revealed by God that is gained by the study of nature isn't just sort of that's not the end, right? It should raise in your mind, this is what Augustine is saying, it should raise in your mind, where did this come from? Another, um, I fail to be able to put this on a PowerPoint, maybe Pat can help me with it someday, but <sighs> Newton's universal law of gravitation. It's an inverse square law, right? M1 times M2, well, universal gravitational constant times M1 times M2, the mass of the one times the mass of the other. But remember, that itself is an idealization because it's not like there are only two masses in the universe, but you can sum masses, right, and so on. So G times M1 times M2 over R squared. Now, it's very important that it's over R squared because you can derive Newton's um, planetary laws or sorry, Kep, uh, Kepler's laws of planetary motion from Newton's universal law of gravitation. That's why Newton looks so wonderful. Okay. What's really interesting about that, and it's another moment where you might say, oh, this is really interesting. Like, why the right-hand rule for angular momentum and not the left-hand rule? Because you'll get different stuff, right? The s direction of spin is different if you're right-hand or left-hand. That's why it's chosen, right? <sighs> when I was in college, got one of the first graphics um, monitors for the mainframe in the physics lab and I played around with it just for fun because I was kind of a nerd and um, wrote a program that did orbits. And then I thought, you know, and I just used Newton's law and then I thought, you know, it would be actually interesting to make the R a variable or um, a variable within a function. Suppose it's not just a square. Suppose you put 2.1 in there. What do you get? Suppose you put 2.3 in there, 2.4. Suppose you put 2.01. Just these little variations on the, um, the r, the radius between. Unless you put r squared in there, you don't get ellipses. What you get are variations on spirographs. Everybody remember spirographs? These funky things with the, you got the one wheel going around the other wheel. And then you get really weird ones. And if you put too big an exponent in there, you don't even get a spirograph. You just get the thing just flies off. So to get a closed orbit, right, it's got to be close to r squared. But if it's not r squared, you don't get an ellipse. You get these really beautiful figures. Well, so it doesn't have to be r squared. It is r squared. Now, there might be more fundamental physics as to why, given the more fundamental physics, it's R squared. But that just pushes the question back. Because that more fundamental physics isn't necessary any more than the R squared is. The laws could be different. And so the laws are the way they are for some reason, maybe. Or maybe it's just throw the dice, but what does it mean to say throw the dice? It's like you're avoiding the question, right? So. There's the question of the study of the world around us and then what it tells us. So physics isn't about God, but it may raise questions about God for us that won't be answered by physics. Biology is not about God. It's about life. 
animal life, <coughs> but it may, and, and plant life, but it may raise questions about God for us that it can't answer. Okay. So um, that's what I'm sort of trying to push for here. And what Thomas wants to say is sacred revelation now, what God reveals, God comes to us out of mercy, misericordia, in order that we may love God as friend. To do that, we must know what we are, where we came from, and where we're going. Because that's what it is to love, is to do so with understanding. And the sciences can enrich that understanding. If you don't know what a rock is, to use an example, if you don't know what a rock is, which is fairly easy to know in ordinary experience, but if you don't know what a rock is, you're not going to have any idea that it's a metaphor to say that God is a rock. But is it false because it's a metaphor? We actually tend to think that way because we're moderns. Metaphors express kind of feelings and, you know, poetry. It's like, it's self-expression. It doesn't communicate truth. Augustine, Aquinas, Aristotle before him, Plato, they all thought poetry communicates truth. Bare ruined choirs where late the sweet bird sang is not sentimental. It's saying something about the world. Well, scripture uses metaphors, but to understand a metaphor, you have to understand the non-metaphorical use. If I try to say something about God without the metaphor, I'm probably going to misrepresent God. I'm probably going to anthropomorphize God. So why say God is a rock? Why does scripture say God is a rock? To challenge the idea that I could understand God in some ordinary way. And that's what poetry does. I don't want to say the scripture's poetry, but it uses tools of poetry. And so we need to understand the world around us to understand the revelation better in order that we may love God. So uh, again, I tend to emphasize with my students, you should love the study of science, not fear it. Okay? It's a means that God has given us to better understand God and what God has revealed. Okay. Um, now, um, pause for a minute. Questions? Yes? Can't you run? Or fly, even better? <laughs> or quantum tunnel over I'm there? Since Professor Barr is here, can't you quantum tunnel across the room? <laughs> is it slow? So is the fundamental claim we're making that models that we use in science are inherently now and will always be limited? Is that? Um, I hadn't made that claim, but that's a very good claim to make. Um, <laughs> It's very good, yeah. No, and, and maybe I would have made that claim up, but I hadn't yet. But yeah, I mean, but that's because we're limited. We aren't gods. We are not God. We have this, um, we're not even angels for God's sakes, and thank God for that, right? I don't want to be an angel, right? If I was an angel, I couldn't um, uh, marry a woman and have children with her. What's that? So... Um, I think I said something true there. Um, uh, so I'm a human being who's embodied a living body in a world. How do I gain knowledge ordinarily? I gain knowledge by my encounter with the finite world around me and from others who encounter that same finite world. But you put all that finite knowledge together, you still get finite knowledge and different ways of understanding uh, reality. The same reality. It's not like you've got these, like, I'm, I want to say, it's not like you've got these levels of reality. Oh, there's like the physics level, there's the um, chemistry biology, or chemistry level, although Professor Barr might disagree with me. There's the life level, as if for each of these sciences, you're, you're describing a, a kind of layered cake. It's, I'm a human being, and you can talk about me as subject to the laws of physics. And that's true, but it's limited. I'm a, um, a human being, and you can talk about me with, with the laws of chemistry. And they might be related to the laws of physics. And it's true, but it's limited. Biology, true, but limited. But I am this being in this world. 
that is not completely understood by any of those things. And I'm not completely understood within the realm of what we now call philosophy, ethics, right? Um, what, where am I completely understood? I am completely understood in the mind of God. God sees the depth of my being, not the layers of my being, but the depth of my being. I'm trying to understand myself so that I can love God more, which is why God made me, and to love one another more as God loves us. So everything we can know, to the extent that we can know it, helps us there. But even then, we don't have enough, and so God, in his mercy, helps us with something more. And that's shown to us in Jesus Christ. I'm not a theologian, and I'm not just bragging, but um, <laughs> so now I'm not going after the accountants. I'm going after the theologians. Um, where's John Cavanini? I'm glad he's not here. He wouldn't have me back. Um, no, but I mean, ultimately, this is why we need theology and more than just philosophy. Because philosophy by itself would be Pelagian. Theology is a reminder that it, philosophy can assist. It cannot get us there. Help us uh, achieve our destiny. Got somebody down here? Or? Yeah, we, I'm sorry, we got two people listening through the stream. If oh, you don't okay. Mind. Okay, Dr. Kim. The first one, he wants to go back a little further to the, earlier to the lecture, um, was asking about... Uh, are you saying that faith isn't a claim to knowledge or wisdom? Just a clarification on that. And I think you did kind of address it, but if you could speak so to that there again. So there are different notions of faith here. Okay, it's a, it's a multifaceted word. Um, what I might do is switch to a different word, and that is belief, credo. So if you're a Catholic, every mass you say credo and unum deum, or you say I believe in one God, right? So credo. Um, Again, I study Thomas Aquinas. Thomas Aquinas will talk about three different ways you can understand fa uh, faith as belief. Okay? One, he'll say, there's the kind of ordinary sense where you say there's a claim. A claim about the world or about God. Well, God is good, or um, the world was created by God, or um, that man's my father. Right? That's why I make the analogy there. Um, I should probably be looking at the camera rather yeah, than you, right? Sorry. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of believing that a statement is true, okay? And you do that all the time in the sciences. You believe statements are true on the basis of a number of things, including experiment, but not always experiment because you rely upon the work of others, okay? So there's believing a statement to be true, but then there's believing or having faith in someone. So I believe Jim Lang, my physics teacher. In order that I can believe that, it will be helpful to think of myself as a point mass. I believe that I'm a point mass in an idealization. Why do I believe that? Because I believe Dr. Lang. So that's a different sense of it. But then Aquinas will say there's a third sense of credo, and that he calls credo in deum. I believe in God which wouldn't be the case with an awful lot of uh, instances of ordinary belief. And what he means by that is because I believe God and because I believe that certain things are true because I believe God, I direct my will to God as my end. That's believing in God, the way in which a spouse might say of their spouse, I believe in you. Because right? I can believe my spouse that, for instance, I'm the father of these children, and yet not be in relation in the way in which one means one is in relation by saying, no, I believe in you. Not just I believe you, but I believe in you, having to do with our destiny together and what we are trying to do. And so there's different senses of that. And so one sense of faith would be claims to knowledge. God created the heavens and the earth. <coughs> I, or, um, I believe in one God, the Father of the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. These are claims about reality. I believe them because I believe God. But then also when we say credo in unum deum, I believe in God. So by affirming those statements, 
Because of God, I direct myself to God when I recite the creed. It's not this kind of simple just, well, what are the facts? By reciting those facts and expressing my belief or that I believe God, I also direct my will to God. So it's kind of a complicated um, structure, but certainly faith makes claims. There's no question about it, and claims of knowledge. A follow-up, it was, uh, and it had to do with a question a little earlier, related to revelation. Um, or can, we, can we clarify and make a distinction between a, special, a supernatural or divine revelation and natural revelation and how they're both needed? <clears throat> In fact, this kind of goes back to, um, what was your name for yeah. that? Aaron's question or comment. And that is yes. But you're not going, so the notion of, I'll put it this way, natural revelation you would only call the knowledge of the world that you gained through the sciences and through history and so on, you'd only call that a natural revelation if you already thought there's a revealer. Right? So there's a way in which describing the knowledge of the world that um, Augustine is describing here, Hopkins describes in the first slide, you see that as revelation, natural revelation, because you think the world is created as the wonderful famous, wonderful Southern novelist um, Walker Percy put it in um, one of his books or a number of his books, if there's a sign, there must be a sign giver. But what that presupposes is that you've already seen the world as a sign rather than just as it is, right? So I may come across um, a object uh, right in the, a little to my right, as I'm driving my car, I see an object a little to my right that has a metal pole and an octagon um, on it that has red paint on it and um, letters on it. And those letters say stop. Now, I could approach that and see that simply as a pole a little to my right with an octagon on it with red paint that has letters on it that if I were to read them as a sign would tell me to stop. But of course, I could also just see a rod with an octagon on it with red and white paint on it. So I have to understand it already as a sign, or sorry, that it was placed there by a sign giver to see it as a sign. And that's what I would say about the point about natural revelation is it's a good thing, the idea of natural revelation, because you're already, again, I'm a philosopher, I say take a step back. What's presupposed in talking about natural revelation? that you are already committed to the idea of a revealer. And, you rev and a way of then understanding this is to say, God reveals God through creation, and God reveals God through special divine revelation to the prophets, to the Jews in a certain place, certain time, culminating in the incarnation of Christ. God reveals that. But that's what then raises the question, how should we see these things as related? One would say, well, we see them as related because they're about two different things, non-overlapping magisteria. One would say, no, they're not non-overlapping, and the one rules out the other. What I'm saying is that at least as part of the Christian tradition of which I'm a part, says the one enriches the understanding of the other, precisely because it's a revelation from the same being for the same purpose. Why did, go back to the Baltimore Catechism, which... Professor Barr probably wrote. Um, he's, uh, <laughs> uh, he's not that much older than I am. What's that? I'm the same age, more or less. Yeah. But I'm a young person in spirit. You know. um, why did God make me? Well, God made me to know him, to, to know him, to love him, to serve him in this life, and to be with him in the next. That's a point about love. But of course, he didn't just make me. He made all of this world in which I live as a way of enriching that movement towards God. And we do actually know this world, though in a limited way. So the knowledge of the world that we gain in science enriches this ultimate destiny that God has given to human beings and to the best of our knowledge to no other animal creature. Maybe there will be animals in heaven. Maybe. 
But we know there will be human beings in heaven. But they're human beings. It's not angels. We're not angels. We live in a world that we're destined, and in, I would even say um, commanded to know and to use everything we can to know it in order to enrich what God has revealed to us. Okay? More questions from the, the space, the quantum void? <laughs> okay. So maybe... Um, we can talk just a little bit in the time remaining to us about language. So revelation, so the sciences take place as a human enterprise in language. Again, because we are animals, we speak to one another. We learn from one another. How is that done? Through language. It's also the case that in revelation, Reve revelation until the culmination of Jesus Christ, but even subsequent to Jesus Christ, say, in the letters and the Acts and the Gospels, is communicated to us in language. To under, so to understand how it is we come to know epistemologically, we have to understand certain things about language. And it's a feature of human language that it employs metaphor and image. And I um, uh, mentioned a little bit earlier, we may have a tendency to think that if something says, um, metaphor, or if something's a metaphor, we'll say, well, it's not literally true. This is not the way St. Augustine thought, and it's not the way Aquinas thought after him. It makes it sound like, you know, and, and to a certain extent it's true, it's sort of like, how the heck did we go off board on all this stuff? Not on the physics. The physics has genuinely gotten much, much better, which is an understatement. But the understanding of language. Augustine was trained as a rhetorician trained to be able to say things that fi people find appealing and draw them in. Well, think of scripture that way. There's lots of things that in scripture aren't appealing, right? That are, it's a struggle to understand. But if you're God and you're not human, so you don't need language, how do you communicate to human beings? You can't just zap them. For it to be our understanding, it has to be our understanding. And it has to be in the way in which we understand, reflecting upon the world and through language. God doesn't, I mean, that's again one reason for the, I don't like the translation of in the beginning was the word, because it makes it sound like there's some sort of, you know, table talk going on in the Trinity. Right? In the beginning was the intelligibility, the logos. Well, we get logos, intelligibility, and understanding through discourse. So if God is going to communicate to us this necessary knowledge, he's got to use human language. And that human language, any human language, embodies a pre-existing store of knowledge of the world. So again, that's why you pursue knowledge of the world, to enrich the language within which you understand God's revelation. So again, my simple example, God is a rock. You'll say, well, that's metaphorical and it's not literally true. That's the sense of literal there was a, a development after Galileo. The idea is a literal truth uses plain language. Maybe the plain language of science, which is mathematics, if you're particularly scientific, but it doesn't say things like God is a rock and it doesn't say that Notre Dame was a ferocious lion on the field yesterday. But look, I can communicate something to you. Notre Dame was a ferocious lion on the field yesterday tearing up the opponent. One thing you know is they won. Right? And I said that without saying they won. But you understand that through a metaphor. One of the things that drives me crazy now is the way in which people constantly add the word literal to a literal statement. <laughs> I was literally driving to school. And I want to say to them, as opposed to metaphorically, I, I literally was stunned by the show. Well, stunned, is that a metaphor or is that a plain term? Stunned has something to do with like a certain sort of animal, ultimately, that bites you, that stuns you, like a jellyfish or a bee. Okay. 
stun. That's kind of, well, but we wouldn't necessarily think of that as a metaphor. Well, that's because our language is such that we're constantly using metaphors to communicate literal truths. No, metaphors communicate truth. And for Augustine, literal language employed metaphors. And so we need to understand what the metaphor is trying to communicate that is not so easily communicated with an ordinary language term. The way I tend to think of it is, there's a way of reading scripture that we think is the literal reading, which I would say is the fifth grade reading. It's the way in which a fifth grader would read it, who has not yet learned the different ways in which truth is communicated with figures. Okay? Truth is communicated with figures. So, Genesis. Our tendency nowadays is to say, if we're scientifically um, adept, as we should be, our tendency is to say, well, Genesis isn't literally true. Augustine and Aquinas would say, of course it's literally true. One, because there's a danger of spiritualizing Genesis, which is, again, what the Gnostics did. It's spiritually true. Well, if you don't understand literal truth, how the hell do you understand spiritual truth? Because the application of the term spirit to truth is a metaphor. Truth isn't a spirit. Spiritual truth, what does that mean? That was the danger. So Augustine says, look, we have to say that this language of scripture is communicating to us truths about God and the world. That's what it means to make a literal statement, to communicate something true about God and the world. The way things are, states of affairs, what the author intends to communicate about the world and about God. So when Shakespeare says, bare ruined choirs where late the sweet birds sang, that's literally true. But you have to ask, what about the world is being communicated when Shakespeare says that? Literally true for Augustine. So, problems of the first two stories of Genesis. Oh, wait a minute. If you're in the science and religion debate, you kind of forget that there are two stories. Right? There are two stories. In the first story, you get day one, day two, day three, day four. On the fourth day, and we mentioned this last night, on the fourth day, the sun is created. Wait a minute. Boy, they were really ignorant. Whoever wrote that was really ignorant to use the word day in a world in which there was no sun. Or, well, what was the author trying to communicate? I mean, this is one of the simplest uh, um, objections to religious uh, belief on the part of those who think that science gives it to us all and, and religion is irrationality is, these people are so stupid they don't realize you can't have a day without a sun. One, two, three, four. Oh, sun, now we've got days. Well, what were those? Oh, those were spiritual days. <laughs> those were the days of the spirit. And I bet if you went back and looked into the Gnostics, there might be somebody who said that. It's like spiritual rain. Only we're too blinded by original sin to see them. <sighs> so there's that problem. Then there's this other problem. Look at the second story. In the first story, human being, male and female, is created on the sixth day. In the second story, when are human beings created? Day, well, in the second story, it's not days, it's just in the beginning, yeah, yeah. But first, and then everything is created after. Wait a minute, the first story says everything is created before and then the human being is the last, or human nature, male and female, he made them to his image and likeness and he blessed them and he said, be fruitful and multiply as the last thing. First story, they come first. Isn't this a contradiction? Well, how do you solve a contradiction if you're clever? Well, you either reject it, you say it's not really saying anything, or you spiritualize it. On the other hand, you might say, well, what's intended to be communicated by the two different stories? So Professor Barr, if he teaches you general physics, 
Not only is he going to start out by telling you you're a point mass. Literally true? Well, not in our sense of literal. But in terms of what the physics professor is trying to communicate in order to teach you laws of conservation and vector addition, sure, literally true. Limited by the image used, but sure. It's not false. It is literally true, but using an image to communicate the literal truth. So what's happening with Genesis? We'll talk more about this tomorrow since that was the thing. But you might say that the literal truth of the first story is that creation has an intelligible order. Now John, this first century Jew who could speak Greek, can any of you speak Greek? What's that? You can read Greek. It wasn't easy, was it? John, ignorant first century Jew, and of course I'm being facetious there, because this is going out on the internet. I'm being facetious there. John understands Greek well enough to use an image at the beginning of the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the logos. The image is the in the beginning, because that beginning is not a temporal beginning. That's a beginning before the beginning of time. That means it can't be a temporal beginning. What is it? It's an image that communicates a literal truth, and that is the beginning of Genesis proceeds from the non-temporal beginning of the intelligibility of God as creature in an orderly fashion. Okay. And again, Professor Barr will tell you about all the order there is in all this stuff we think is confusing because it involves chance. It's a wonderful book that he wrote on this, if you want to learn about it. Second story, just to set up for tomorrow. What's the second story? We are literally in our creation in a relationship to God. Of companionship and friendship. Adam was not complete as a companion for God without Eve. It has a moral feature to it, but a moral feature that's based in reality. We are made for companionship with God and with one another in God. That's factually true. What does the second story give us? According to a different image than the first story, we are now alienated from God because of what we have done. That's not spiritually true. That is reality. We are alienated from God. And then the rest of the story, well, how do we return to God from our alienation? Jesus Christ is not spiritually incarnate. He's literally incarnate, even though I hate when people say literally. <laughs> so we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you, Dr. O'Callaghan.